uh, before we start our program today, I would request that we all stand up and observe silence for the victims of the accident in Orissa. So we meet again today, continuing our series. Uh, this is the fourth continuous week that we are meeting and I'm so happy to see a sizable audience today. Uh, today's topic is again very, very contextual, I mean, and relevant. It is about an alternative development agenda for India. We have an eminent panel here of development economists as well as an eminent journalist who will put together for us this entire program and moderate it. So without further ado, let me introduce our panelists. We have an eminent civil servant and more than a civil servant, uh, a development economist who gave up the civil service uh, and went on to work in the UN and the Asian Development Bank. And she served not only, uh, she settled down in Chennai after retirement. In the UNDP, she was assigned to work on poverty, inequality and human development in countries of Asia and the Pacific. While in the ADB, she continued uh, to work on international development challenges for the Asia Pacific region. I am talking of none other than Anuradha Rajivan. She's here with us. We are honored, ma'am. Please join us on the stage. We have with us Mr. Sampat Kumar, who is a qualified chartered accountant who entered us as a service, uh, as a management trainee at the machine tool division of Cooper Engineering. And after a stint at Cooper Engineering, he joined the Tata Engineering and uh, the Telco in 1976, which is now Tata Motors. And then after a number of other assignments in the industry, he switched to academics and joined the Institute for Financial Management and Research, IFMR, as a faculty member in 84 and served in that capacity for a period of nine years till 1993. Besides contributing to the Institute's executive development programs, he undertook a number of consulting and research assignments in strategic and financial management areas of various organizations. Then he switched careers and joined the Hindu business line as a corporate editor just before the newspaper was launched in 1994. He has written extensively on financial markets macroeconomic policies besides major national and international corporate and business developments. He served in the position of editor business line from September 2011 to July 2013. He has been retained as an editorial consultant for the newspaper during the period from 2013 to 2017. He also currently offers a course in financial markets at the Asian College of Journalism. Welcome Mr. Sampath Kumar, it's a pleasure to have you at CIC. It's my pleasure now to introduce the main speaker of the day, the author of a book on the subject, An Alternative Development Agenda for India. Mr. Sanjay Kaul, please put your hands together for him. Mr. Sanjay Kaul is a development policy analyst, corporate leader and a former IAS officer. He has over four decades of rich and professional experience in both the government and the private sectors. During his long tenure as a civil servant, he worked at leadership positions across several development sectors. After putting in about 28 years, he took a voluntary retirement from the civil service. And uh, following which he worked with the National Commodity Management Services Limited, a leading agri-business company as MD and CEO and later as chairman from June 2008 
to August 2021. He is presently chairperson of the Early Childhood Care and Education (ECCE) task force set up by the Government of India. He is an independent director at both Seva Gra Rin Limited, an affordable housing finance company, and an independent director at Digi Grain Solutions Private Limited, an agri business venture. He is a trustee of the UN's World Food Program Trust in India, as well as trustee of the Karnataka Health Promotion Trust. He works actively with Mobile Crèches, a leading child rights NGO on which he has served as his chairperson and continues on his governing council. He also serves on the managing committee of several DPS schools. A postgraduate in economics from the Delhi School of Economics, uh, he began his career as a college lecturer in economics at Delhi University and has retained his interest in academics and writing. His book, An Alternative Development Agenda for India, has recently been published by the Routledge, a uh, reputed UK publishing house. And the publishers and the author have come up and offered the book at a concessional price here. So those of you who are interested, he has also agreed to sign copies for uh, the audience. It's my pleasure and honor, sir, to welcome Sri Sanjay Kaul. Please put your hands together. Sir. Good evening to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you after quite a long time, but better late than never for me. So uh, I'm thankful to the CIC for inviting me to moderate this uh, session on uh, Mr. Cowell's book on alternative development agenda. And um, before any further delay, let me invite Mr. Cowell to uh, present his book to this audience and then uh, we will take it from there. Mr. Cowell. Thank you. Good evening and uh, thank you uh, the Chennai International Center and Mr. Chandramoli for agreeing to host this discussion. Uh, I would particularly like to thank Mr. Sampath Kumar and Anu for agreeing to be discussants at this conference, at this uh, workshop and discussion. And also I'd like to thank Venu without whom this, I would not have been here today. Uh, what I plan to do in the next 15 odd minutes is to give what I think are principal takeaways and uh, what triggered this uh, idea to write a book on the alternative development agenda. So the first fundamental question that you may ask is, what was the need to have this alternative approach. After all, you could argue that India since the liberalization of the 1990s has had a reasonably satisfactory GDP growth. Uh, we've seen, for instance, the RBI governor recently announced that this current year, year that's ended, you'll be getting a GDP growth of 7.2%, which by all standards is something we can be proud about. Uh, and you could also perhaps argue that even within the fiscal constraints, both the state and the states have, over a period of time, been implementing large number of welfare programs for the poor. So it's not as if growth has not been accompanied by welfare programs. So, But I argue that while all this is true, we also must note and recognize some disturbing signs that have emerged. And if you look at countries across, India has become one of the most unequal of societies. Uh, you also have estimates vary, but I think the picture is clear that unemployment levels uh, are not something that we can be very proud about, or, uh, go home about, uh, talk to people about. The, Human development indicators like health, education, nutrition, the focus of my book, have improved, but do not altogether tell a very flattering story uh, for a country which aspires to be one of the leaders at the, uh, at the global stage. Uh, a significant section of the population, especially in urban settlements, reside in conditions can, that can only be described as unlivable. Yet, yes, there are exceptions. And in fact, 
where we are today in Tamil Nadu is a kind of exception because you have had one state where GDP growth has also been accompanied by reasonably good human development indicators. And so is Kerala an exception. But if you take the country as a whole, uh, human development indicators, poverty levels are not something home uh, that you can be proud of. And even in Tamil Nadu, I was doing some basic research that there are vast pockets that need priority attention. Districts such as Tiruvannamalai, uh, uh, Viluparam, Tiruvannur, Pudukottai and Shivganga not only have poor human development indicators, but also have poor per capita incomes. So then what is this alternative development approach that I'm talking about? And the hypothesis that I advocate is that we move away from an exclusive focus on GDP growth. Uh, and I feel that a clear focus on human development and livelihoods is a better approach than a pure focus on GDP, even if it is accompanied by a slew of welfare measures. This approach would not only bring in greater equity, but more critically by enhancing the productive capacity of our people provide the platform for high and more sustainable GDP growth. So I'm saying if you reverse this, not hope that GDP growth will lead to better quality of life, but a better quality of life, a better quality of working population will itself generate the triggers for better growth. And I also argue that we don't have too much time. India has a limited window of perhaps the next two or three decades at best where we can exploit this demographic dividend. Because then India will again move like countries in the West and like, like China has already started, uh, get on to the transition of an aging society. So it is in this context that I strongly argue the time for course correction is now. And that is the relevance of why this book today. And my book does offer what I feel is a feasible development agenda, which I call the people first agenda. The starting point must, and we have been civil servants and so has Anu been here, address a fundamental question and so must Chandramoli ask, why have government policies and programs not provided significantly improved well-being and livelihoods for poor households and jobs for the millions of our unemployed youth? In my quest for answers, I've been singularly fortunate that I've had the privilege of looking at the government both as an insider, as an IS officer, but also as an outsider in the corporate sector leading an agribusiness uh, firm. I've also been fortunate to have had discussions with colleagues and friends and Anu and Raj even present here were part of the discussion when we started discussing the beginnings of my book. And uh, uh, also fortunate that I've had the privilege of working in social development sectors like education, health, food and nutrition. And of course, in the corporate world, in the agribusiness sector. My uh, uh, understanding has been re uh, reinforced by the significant amounts of evidence-based scholarly work in the development policy literature, both in India and abroad. And I've taken a lot of learnings of what governments can do and what it cannot do. In framing an alternative development agenda, I have consciously picked on six, seven sectors, seven sectors actually, which I feel matter most to people. And these are health, obviously health, education, food and nutrition, child, the young child, gender, livelihoods and jobs, and urbanization. I'll come a little bit to why urbanization fits in to all this uh, other identified areas of human development and livelihoods. This approach, I believe, is better than the conventional approach of looking at economic development, even by development economists, through the economic sectors of agriculture, industry, services, trade and finance, and monetary and finance policies, which typically economics development or economic growth literature does. Each chapter starts with a dispassionate analysis of the systemic issues plaguing the sector, followed by what I feel are practical, practical and implementable solutions to address them. And in addition, and in what in my views sets this book apart from other excellent development policy literature is that I have try to view these issues not through my eyes as a civil servant, but from the eyes of a, a typical impoverished family. In my book, this fictional tribal family 
of Birsa and Rasika and their three children's travails connect the narratives and the chapters. And therefore, the book is not limited to critiquing government policies, but rather it is an attempt to trigger a healthy debate among civil servants, the academia, policymakers, and the people at large on vital issues so that we can uh, come up with more practical and implementable solutions. So therefore, in looking at issues from the lens of Birsa and Rasika, a few connected and fundamental premises emerged when I started writing the book. First, I realized that our current preoccupation with GDP growth, as I mentioned, did not automatically provide Birsa and Rasika and her ilk with the kind of quality of life or vast improvements in their conditions, even when their large welfare programs to the poor. Second, and contrary to conventional opinion, I find that government mismanagement and corruption may not automatically explain poor outcomes in welfare programs. Instead, it's the, uh, it's the book's hypothesis that an in inadequate understanding of poor households and the way we approach poverty and the poor result when we design programs in uh, systemic flaws of many development, human development and livelihood programs. Finally, the book's analysis shows that poor households may not get the significantly enhanced livelihoods through agriculture and traditional livelihoods. So therefore, the government's obsession with having programs for rural households, for traditional households, may not give us the kind of aspirational growth for these households that we would like. And that is why this focus on urbanization, and that I do sincerely do believe, as globally trends show, that only large-scale planned urbanization uh, can provide the millions of jobs that India requires. The central theme, theme that therefore emerges is that an alternative development agenda sharply focused on people's well-being and livelihoods is not only an urgent imperative, but also one that is fiscally and fiscally uh, uh, sustainable to implement. And I have tried to argue that it is possible to do this within the governments of government uh, functioning, the corruption that we are, uh, it is associated with, and existing ground realities. So families such as Birsa and Rasika are so caught up in their daily struggles that they even re often remain untouched. And I go into some amount of detail in the book why they remain untouched by well-intended government programs. We currently have hundreds of programs, and I counted up to 400 and beyond, many of them with very minuscule budgets. So at the district level, really the collector will not even have time to run through uh, the list of programs that he or she is supposed to implement. And each of them have systemic shortcomings because of the design pro problems, because we have not looked at these programs at the design and conception stage from the eyes of the household who the target group is. And therefore, I argue that given the limited implementation capacity, rather than have these hundreds of programs, it's better to focus on critical interventions that can have a visible and tangible impact on our lives. And I've, through the book, tried to identify for each sector what these critical interventions could be. And in each sector, we ask, we begin by asking very uncomfortable questions and basic questions. And I'll share with you in the next seven, eight minutes, some of the issues that questions that I asked to give you a flavor of the book that I've written. In the health sector, for instance, which is the first sector that I discussed, the first question which will arise, why is the service quality of our primary healthcare system and the large hospital, hospitals poor, so poor in contrast to well-run private facilities? Why is it that despite an extensive hospital network and last vast number of primary health centers, the first port of call for poor households, even today, in most parts of the country, and Tamil Nadu is not an exception, is not the health provider appointed by the government, but the local health provider, the traditional healer. The book challenges the conventional wisdom that India, in fact, needs more hospitals and more PHCs. Uh, we have Mr. Shankar, who is a health expert here, and uh, he will shortly be writing a book on health management. And I hope I, he agrees with my view that the problem is not the numbers. In fact, the book's analysis reveals that a numbers game only diverts meager resources away from the upkeep and 
uh, maintenance and service quality of existing hospitals and could even be an obstacle, I argue, to strengthening the existing pu public health system. Would not therefore, for instance, improving the existing PHCs and primary health care and the existing community level and district level hospitals reduce the pressure on district level and tertiary hospitals such as the All India Institutes. After all, most patients coming to AIMS ought to have been handled at a much lower facility. In addition, rather than focus only on curative cure, cure, uh, cure to the hospital system, we argue that a well-designed preventive and promotive healthcare system would reduce the number of people coming needing hospitalization in the first place. From health, we move to foods insecurity and malnutrition. And here, some of what I am saying is not going to be good news for civil society and food, security, food rights activists. India spends close to as much as three crores annually on food security and nutrition, which includes the world's largest public distribution system, the world's largest midday meal program, the world's largest child nutrition program under the ICDS. And despite these large programs of nutrition, we still have one of the largest levels of malnutrition and uh, calorie deficits. And we ask a fundamental question, does poverty alone explain the situation? The book argues, in fact, that poverty and hunger do not always go hand in hand. Uh, the, the analysis that we have done tries to show that it has been incorrectly assumed that the, simply the supply of cereal, which successive governments, both in Tamil Nadu and the center have been doing, and supply of nutrition supplements will automatically care, take care of malnutrition and hunger. As we explore in the book, we need to go into the minds of Brissa and Dasika and understand their household behavior and why this does not impact or lead to higher nutrition outcomes. For example, I argue that intensive household outreach and communication through nutrition and health, through a nutrition health educator may be way more cost effective than through enhancing the supply of nutrition supplements under the ICS. The book next shifts its focus on school education and each of these chapters I demonstrate are interconnected. So you cannot have a health sector policy far removed from the school education or nutrition policies. We ask why do government schools perform so poorly? In higher education after all, government institutions are on par or better than privately funded, founded counter counterparts. So why not government schools? It's a basic question that every citizen is entitled to ask. We challenge the conventional wisdom that once you open schools, supply teachers and supply textbooks, the rest will largely take care of themselves. We recognize that lot of formal learning of children who belong to households like ours takes place not in the school, but takes place at home. And this is what Mirsa and Dasika lack, the absence of a learning environment at home. And unless you can handle that, you are not going to see greater performance of children from poor households. Bissa and Dasika and several uneducated households are unable to provide this learning environment and we therefore need to delineate, and this is what I've tried to do, a set of strategies that are teacher friendly, that can improve teacher and government school performance, but also more vitally create this supportive learning environment for children from poor households. Health, nutrition and education, of course, are excellent enablers and human development activists have focused on these three. But I ask, is this enough? Because without in, uh, touching livelihoods there and without jobs, this human development capacity would really not uh, be ex enough to exploit this potential that we have built up. So how does the government create the jobs and livelihoods for the millions of our youth and poor households? And how does it especially enable women to enter the job market in large numbers? Birsa and Rasika and many of their ilk are so caught up in the vicious poverty trap that they continuously borrow money and move from one crisis to another. And despite the best of government strategies, I argue that there will always remain limited opportunities in agriculture and in agricultural labor and in traditional livelihoods. Most labor-intensive manufacturing industries in the recent past, unfortunately, such as apparel and food products, have witnessed either stagnation or a decline. 
Consequently, graduate unemployment has risen sharply, while the number of self-employed self young people has also declined. And of course, the female labor productivity, uh, labor participation rate is at a low of maybe between 20 and 23 percent. The book's analysis shows that most decent livelihoods will not emerge in rural areas, but over 70 percent of GDP growth will be in urban towns and cities. And Tamil Nadu's urban population is amongst the highest across the country, and perhaps which partly explains why its GDP per capita is also amongst the highest. So it's not just human development indicators. The fact that you have reasonably uh, much better levels of urbanization than other parts of the country. Uh, with limited opportunities, therefore, in rural areas, the first step to changing Birsa and Rasika's economic trajectory would not to keep them there, but to uh, permit them to migrate to towns and cities. Uh, however, I argue that imposing rigid conditions on employers through labor laws and providing these households a better quality of life will not encourage employers and the private sector, and I wear my private sector hack, to, to create these jobs and to start these enterprises. Instead, rather than putting the bur burden of job security, health, and housing on the employers, I strongly advocate that this should be the onus on government to afford, uh, to provide, uh, create an environment for, for affordable housing, create employment for better living conditions, and a better health coverage for migrant and casual labor. And we identify, through the course of the book, multiple building, uh, building blocks for supporting labor-intensive enterprises in urban areas to absorb the migrant labor influx. In this context, it is important to note, uh, and I go to the context of Tamil Nadu again, a success in manufacturing. And due to its well-developed industrial clusters such as in textiles, leather, fireworks, IT, automotive, cement, and poultry. However, I argue that in most states, and certainly Karnataka where I worked was, an, was not an exception, the industries department worked in isolation with the urban development department. They didn't think that they have much to do with each other. And I argue that you cannot have manufacturing clusters without having the environment for housing people who are going to be based in those industries. Uh, so industrial clusters by themselves have to be backed by urban clusters which are well designed and planned. And they must be able to absorb this large influx, influx of migration where manufacturing hubs are already located and where their potential. And therefore it is, becomes important to focus on the living conditions and the quality of life in these manufacturing clusters or in these towns and cities. Clusters of manufacturing can thrive and grow only if they're supported by, by vast improvements in urban infrastructure and services where the, these clusters are based. The next question, and this is one of my final questions, is when house, households do migrate and cities, where do they live? And we're not talking of small numbers. An estimated 25% already live in slums, and we are now talking of large-scale migration. Maybe as much as 50 million households coming into towns and cities in the next two decades. This is about a 300 population, the size of America, getting into our towns and cities. The living conditions in urban settlements, even for existing poor households, is deplorable. In this most challenging situation, what can and what should government do? Should it live in denial and continue to look for solutions for livelihoods in rural areas? Or look at trends globally and even within the country and begin planning for the influx that is not only ine inevitable, but also most because most economic growth will come only in urban areas. And already 60% of India's GDP comes from urban areas. We therefore ask basic questions like, what can governments do to improve the deplorable state of sanitation and sewerage, not only in large cities, but more deplorable conditions in the smaller towns and settlements. How can it deal with the near, near absence of decent low-income housing when these large low-income households come into these cities? And how can it reduce the congestion on our roads? Now, this is a, something which we face every day. The book advocates a fresh approach with what I feel are rather counterintuitive proposals. 
we for instance argue that the plotted development of giving out house sites which lot of cities like delhi bangalore and chennai perhaps also followed uh, initially in its growth has actually led to cities which are more akin to an urban sprawl and uh, uh, we need to counter that now we argue that housing for the urban poor that has been hitherto neglected must become a focus of urban planning however in sharp contrast to standard government conventional arguments which would say that government should buy land allotted to the poor uh, have pattas i argue that all these experiments in the last 70 years have failed you are not able to deal with the the, the large influx of households which will come and government is ill equipped to handle that so i argue and this is contentious that that we need to create a private sector led low income housing market after all low middle class households can rent buildings uh, poor households cannot buy houses they do not have the wealth or the capacity to buy it but they have the wealth to say buy something which is 5000 7000 rupees available so large scale uh, low income housing private housing if it exists this is the place that would they would come rather than set up shop on top of drainages and set up houses there uh, this would of course mean certain relaxations in building bylaws when builders are building for low income households and i've got into what kind of incentives you can provide to builders so that they get in from middle class housing and elite luxury housing into low income housing after all they are working at a profit and if it makes economic sense for them to do that they will build smaller smaller ews type of housing and then let's move from housing to something else which touches the citizens and touches poor households most and so public transport system and again i ask a very contentious question and all of you all of you have been beneficiaries of the metro system uh, is bus transport not a more cost effective strategy in comparison to the high capex metro system and i'm not talking of the chennai bus transport i'm not talking of those buses i'm talking of a makeover of the chennai buses like you had a makeover of the railway train into the metro system for example let us take a dispassionate look at chennai's metro Uh, from what i could gather the phase 2 of chennai metro which is currently under uh, implementation is estimated to cost 70000 crores and would cover 180 18 kilometers at around 650 crores per kilometer by limiting this metro line by 5 kilometers one could finance over 4000 volvo ac buses which will completely ch change the landscape of chennai's public transport system and ease congestion on the roads and be able to do it within a space of one or two years and if thousand of these could be earmarked for women it may serve women commuters better from a safety and con convenience point of view rather than ba bangalore's karnataka's announcement of free bus travel for uh, women commuters similarly we ask should governments continue to yield to the demand from vehicle owners like us to widen roads and build more flyovers which leads to shrinkage of pedestrian paths and walkways or should we give priority to building more pedestrian paths and there's a survey which is done for bombay which shows that 55% of bombay's commuters do not use the train or uh, or buses or even vehicles but walk to work and back <coughs> and it should be possible for chennai to even exceed that percentage if the focus shifts on pedestrian paths and walkways away from flyovers and roads transport pundits pundits are unanimous in their view that transport planning must have its objectives movement of people and not movement of cars and once you have that mindset change then obviously you will focus on where and how people need to commute thus the focus on reducing Uh, congestion on roads focus on buses and walking paths would go a long way of facilitating uh, improved quality of life for these migrant households of course as i argued city buses do require an image makeover but if metro was able to do that so can the bus transport do do that so we are not arguing against the metro system but we must analyze where our priorities must lie 
at look at looking at strategies for livelihoods a key focus has to be on women's livelihoods because with the 20% female labor participation rate you are really not exploiting the demographic dividend i'm not only talking as a gender activist but as a pure economist you can't keep uh, women who are educated and able not in the workforce and there does exist a huge op uh, opportunity of women's mobilization through self help groups but i argue against this kind of self help groups which i feel is basically uh, uh, dedicated largely to consumption finance and very little of it is really creating productive capacity of these households and therefore you require an, a set of strategies to incentivize self help groups and women in those groups to get into livelihood finance i also argue and uh, mr chidambaram agreed with my view and i wrote a paper on this that the mudra loans which the finance minister went to town about has really not enhanced livelihoods for instance at 4 million 400 million loans been able to engage even one more uh, one more employee it would have solved the problem of unemployment uh, the fundamental flaw is that it has become a numbers game with targets given to states targets given to banks and any government which goes by numbers and targets is obviously going to be short in terms of outcomes most loans have been extremely tiny less than 50000 and there's evidence that most of them are not able to generate if one full year even one one additional employee so basically even even small uh, tiny businesses require a minimum scale to flourish grow and generate sustainable employment and i have therefore tried to advocate what site of strategies should be there to actually promote these tiny businesses the development agenda that we have set out is as i said an integrated one connecting all these sectors Uh, and one final set of questions which our finance pundits will ask yes there may be some good strategies in the book but where is the money uh, does this agenda mean pulling out resources from uh, areas like the national highways which admittedly have triggered lot of uh, growth or from critical sectors like defense or from port and uh, highway infrastructure and of course each successive government also announces a host of promises like the recently elected karnataka and i was there yesterday has done so the fiscal space for doing something different will remain very limited and i have therefore tried to estimate uh, these critical interventions and what they would cost and i find that even within these constraints of assurances and welfare program there is that fiscal space available uh, we have estimated the amounts required and conclude that a mere 2% of gdp both combined with central and the states would be adequate to fund this people first development agenda and tax experts are unanimous in their view that india's tax to gdp ratio at 17% is very low in fact the 15 pay commission itself has argued that it is very low therefore there is potential to garner an additional 5% of tax revenue i argue not only to fund this books development agenda but to also finance other vital areas of the economy uh, i have try to not compromise on academic uh, rigor so some of you might find that the number of references run into some pages but i have attempted to write the book and yet in a reader friendly and accessible um, uh, style because i i have not targeted the book for development economists or professionals in this space it should be of interest to the general reader and the concerned citizen and not limited to economists and social sectors and even civil servants and policy makers it should touch every citizen the overall arching hypothesis is that a care and responsible polity that ensures the well-being and a decent livelihood for all uh, citizens is not only needed but is possible i hope that this book triggers a healthy debate and discussion on these issues i would indeed be pleased if a few even a few of these proposals find a mention in the election manifesto of political parties as we head toward the 2024 elections and i seek your support uh, my book is available for you to read outside and eagerly look forward to 
the very enriching discussion that Anu and uh, Sampath Kumar have uh, brought with us today. Thank you very much and thank you CIC for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Kaul. That was a masterful exposition of an alternative development agenda besides critiquing the existing development model that we have followed for the last 60, 70 years. Uh, uh, I particularly want to congratulate you on your use of uh, the uh, a metaphorical character of uh, Munda, uh, sorry, sorry, Birsa and Rasika. Uh, as one who has been practicing writing as a craft for my livelihood for the last 25 years or so, uh, I thought that was a very fine touch. And uh, so, uh, I, I, in fact, it made the whole book otherwise uh, a very, very tough reading, so much more uh, easier to read. In fact, the first thing I did was that every chapter I take, I'll first go to the last uh, the box where, uh, you know, Birsa's and Rasika's uh, experiences would be synthesized. Okay, now I know what this chapter is going to be about and then I read the rest of the chapter. So, uh, so therefore, uh, as, a, as a writer, as a journalist who has made writing as a profession, I can tell you that you have hit the nail on the head as far as conveying your ideas as far, you know, in the development agenda is concerned. So thank you once again. Uh, uh, that was a very wonderful uh, uh, presentation. And of course, uh, Ms. Anuradha would uh, definitely have uh, her own take on that. I now request Ms. Anuradha to uh, share her point of view on the book. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me. So, finally, Sanjay, the baby, this book that is, is now born. And this time it's the father and not the mother who went through the entire birthing experience. <laughs> right from the book's conception, the preparation, the periods of waiting, the pain and the pleasure of the whole process was that of the father. So I'm really delighted to be present today at this Chennai event. Work on the book. Work on the book actually started, I think, sometime in uh, 21, 2021. But perhaps it was even a little bit earlier. I do recall some of the bilateral discussions we've had amongst colleagues and friends with you. When Sanjay was thinking about writing something substantive on India's development challenges, when his thoughts were starting to get crystallized, he strongly felt something should be done. And he tried to ask, why should it be done? Why now? And what? is it that should be done. So it was very much an action-oriented kind of thinking right from the start. Of course, we had some arguments and debates. But right from the start, he wanted to produce something that was also an interesting read with an easy flow, while also being solidly researched, relevant, and most importantly, practical. So he was very much on the do-how part as much as the know-how and the why and the analysis. So something accessible to larger audiences especially intelligent readers who were not necessarily development economists, as he already told us, or development practitioners. That is, he wanted it to be accessible to non-technical, non-expert audiences of interest to those who were concerned about India's development story, uh, and also uh, those who had um, a voice, somewhere they had a voice. And so they wanted the people of India to do better. So. He wanted to influence those who could, who had a voice and who had an access into policy making or policy makers, as well as persons who, uh, who could influence those who could influence policies, in other words, the influencers too. So he really didn't want it to be about experts talking to other experts, navel gazing, none of that. This part the book has certainly fully, fully achieved. Now, I've read and worked on many reports and documents over my um, work uh, as part of my own work and over my career. So what was it then that triggered my interest with respect to this baby? What I found was this publication draws primarily from the author's direct experiences and observations, the choice of themes that he's picked, the articulation of the issues. They, re they reflect the encounters he himself has had in the course of his work is based on ground realities as he has observed them, 
So it has a kind of an authenticity and a credibility which is often not seen in academic publications, particularly with ref reference with respect to opportunities to make a difference, to find solutions, and not limited to uh, accuracy of diagnosis alone, going beyond that. It's all about the what next, what to do about it. So that really interested me a lot. I'm also um, a little bit on the inside track. I was honored to be a reviewer for this book. Uh, so as I reviewed the book structure and read through the drafts of the individual chapters, I must say he has succeeded in all of his intentions. As Ampat just said, the story of a fictional couple, the Birsa Rasika story and their children, story of their children, it runs across all the chapters. It's a nice little uh, touch and a nugget that uh, attracts you to read uh, the rest of the chapters. Their struggles of daily living, uh, of course, do bring the narrative alive and work as a continuing thread across chapters through the book. But more importantly, the story of this young couple concretizes the very specific challenges that they face, that a typical poor family would face. And they also point to solutions that would make the Birsa Rasika's family life better. So it does both these things. If we are to become more ambitious about India, all people of India, that is, and not just on average, because improved averages can hide enormous variations uh, in access to benefits, and not mainly for the privileged, then tackling unequal access to the benefits of development becomes a touchstone of, for all policy. Consequently, countering systemic inequality and persisting deprivation that transmits itself across generations becomes central to India's future. And probably we have kind of failed in doing that uh, and that is and the results we see today. Within government too, there seems to be a growing recognition that economic growth does not automatically lift all boats or create opportunities for all. Many boats are leaky to begin with right from the start. Uh, so this needs to inform all of public policy. Then we also look at, uh, the book looks at how poverty is not just about income deficits. This is well established and well uh, acknowledged now. Disadvantage can have many, many roots. Girls can be restricted, for example, by their own families. You don't even have to look at the larger society for that. Certain social groups like castes, people in remote locations, however well off they may be, can be neglected by policy and face continuing and intergenerational policy neglect. So we see this recognition via an increase in the number of schemes being announced by government, like we just uh, counted, uh, the, uh, we did one count of this, right, from cooking gas to bicycles to food grains and transport networks. We've got all these schemes there. So everything is there on paper. So, but some of the questions, despite all that, that, that the book poses us, if that is also, if we have all these fans, uh, large number of schemes, why is India still so much behind much of Southeast Asia? Why is healthcare still not automatic and universal? Why are Sri Lanka and Bangladesh doing better in health than we are? Why do so many still face undernutrition compounded, of course, by poor water, absent sanitation, and a growing footprint of communicable, non-communicable diseases, making them vulnerable to a kind of an ongoing cycle of uh, malnutrition, disease, and in health? So the cross-sectoral linkages are quite obvious uh, right across the back. The book, uh, as we, he said, I have identified seven sectors that matter most to people. Actually, some of them are sectors, according to me, like health, nutrition, uh, education, maybe sectors, while one is really by population, uh, groups, gender. I don't know if that's a sec. I don't, know, don't think it's a sector. Yet another could be the, the, by the urban challenge could be by economic geography. But be that as it may, that's a classification issue. They are all fundamental to the country's development and people's quality of life. Under each of these issues, I found that the book does analyze what has gone wrong and suggests an alternative strategy, which is very concrete, very practical, and in all cases, counterintuitive. So that's what also piqued my interest quite a bit when I read it. I appreciated the focus on solutions, uh, practical ways forward, uh, and also in ways that would not at all burden official budgets. So he's not looking for more money. In fact, the big point that the book makes is that more growth itself will not do it. 
and neither will more public money uh, for the spectrum of poverty countering schemes that we already have such as they are. It is the very design of these interventions that needs to be re-engineered, not simply allocating more money to these schemes that may be flawed in the very in their very conception to begin with, even though all of them are of good intent. So the book does make a convincing case to bring inclusion to the very center with the true track uh, uh, way forward. Track one is supporting, of course, human development, that is people's everyday quality of life, which ultimately should be an end in itself in any case. Um, because in a, and it also it does a supplementary thing of uh, boosting earning capacities and productive capabilities of uh, people. Track two is the support for livelihoods so people can adequately earn for themselves. Now taken together these two tracks are bound to have synergistic effects on each other. Better quality of human development leading to better overall growth for the country, more productivity and vice versa. But I'm not sure uh, yet there are some questions that remain. So I want to also a little bit pinpricks here, not, not too much. Uh, structural bottlenecks. Now these bottlenecks can come in the way of success. So better design scheme or better uh, targeting um, definitely is necessary, but may be, we may only be able to go so far. There is There are uh, structural bottlenecks like really onerous regulations or problems in manufacturing, households unable to take full advantage of trade, for example, due to the whole spectrum of non-tariff barriers. Just one example, the sanitary and phytosanitary um, uh, things that are required before you can even begin to export something. So these are, this is one. Um, the second is the demand side. So why are there not, there is no more pressure from below? Why are people not, if all this is so obvious, and Virsa and Rasika's life is uh, showing us what the, where the problems are, why are, is there not an, uh, pressure from below? And how can this be done? Well, people very easily demand um, small things like cell phones, um, even um, basic needs like water. Why is there no growing pressure for sanitation, for example? or cleaner air. Uh, then the third point is about growing aspirations. To what extent can growing aspirations of the younger generation, uh, the, they are largely unemployed, or underemployed, or even extremely casualized. The modern employment in cities and urban areas are very, they are urban, but they're very casual. They fire and hire and fire. Um, so if, and their aspirations are rising. They see everything uh, through the social media. If they are going to be remain unfulfilled, uh, there's going to be uh, disaffection and we are going to have widen our fault lines so within the society. Then tracking change. How will these outcomes be monitored? So to what extent are official data really ready for scrutiny? and independent assessments to what extent are they going to be valued because what is not measured can just disappear from the radar and from public discourse and finally mindsets how will the bottlenecks from mindsets and social attitudes be addressed now these are some thoughts for a new baby though i'm not sure you're ready no parent will be ready so soon after a new uh, one is already born but overall a very big congratulations sanjay it was a delightful read Thank you, Ms. Dhanuradha. Uh, I think uh, uh, while uh, Mr. Kaul might have experienced the birthing pains, I think uh, you have played a very effective midwifery role in bringing this book out. So you can take uh, some credit for the final outcome that we see in front of us. Uh, I, of course, uh, really don't have much to contribute because in, uh, when to development economists have really uh, shared their perspective on the book. But nevertheless, as a moderator, I have to say something. So let me do uh, say my two cents worth uh, in this context. Uh, you know, uh, public administration is a very, very challenging uh, task. And uh, you know, uh, let, me, let me give you a, an a example, um, uh, partly drawn from my journalistic experience and partly drawn from my uh, personal uh, uh, connections and exchanges with people in, involved in public administration. And um, uh, I mean, I, 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 
don't want to take any names in this context because the person I'm referring to is still in employment in, in civil service and therefore it would not be proper on my part to name the person. But uh, I was once asking this person, uh, he, was, he had just completed his uh, uh, mid-career uh, refresher courses, civil servants after I think uh, 15 years or 20 years uh, have to go through a refresher course and uh, have to do the, uh, a fairly intensive program. And uh, uh, so I was asking this person, how did his um, uh, you know, uh, refresher course go? And how are the uh, people who had come and talked to you about their uh, perspectives? So he said, on the whole, that experience was pretty good. And there were quite a few external guest faculty who had come and uh, talked to us. And uh, he mentioned in passing that uh, Mr. Sainath also, who uh, was of course uh, uh, connected with the Hindu, but uh, I, I can assure you that uh, his connections with the Hindu group goes as far back as 94 when Business Line was launched. And uh, he has been a contributor uh, through his uh, columns uh, of his experience in rural India. And it was quite popular when Business Line was launched. and. Uh, it actually made um, Business Line a different kind of a business newspaper. And uh, so therefore, out of curiosity, I asked him, uh, how was Mr. Sainath's uh, lecture? So uh, he said, yeah, he, he, he speaks very well. I mean, I can assure you that uh, he not only can write very well, he can also articulate very well. Uh, so he said, he speaks very well. But uh, you know, some of his observations were uh, too extreme that I couldn't really quite uh, agree with it. So I said, what was it uh, that particularly thought you thought that was uh, too extreme? So he said that, look, he was talking about a development program in Orissa where their project focused on trying to improve the milk yield of milch animal, uh, more specifically cows. And so the mm -hmm. traditional pres prescription for that is, uh, you know, uh, you go through a program of artificial insemination and uh, also make sure that all the bulls or uh, either forcibly or otherwise incentivized to by, of the owners to sterilize them so that in the long run you would have a completely superior breed of cattle and this is where he made the point he says that as a result of this program one particular native breed of cattle in Orissa was completely eliminated now he said that he found that too difficult to believe he said uh, I mean I more or less paraphrasing what he said, he said, I know we are good, but even we cannot guarantee 100% uh, outcomes on public policies and programs. So therefore, I don't believe that um, uh, we would have really completely exterminated a particular uh, native breed of cattle. And uh, of course, I being a journalist and you know always trying to stoke fire, uh, I said, uh, so later when Sainath was in Chennai, and we ran into each other in the canteen. So I asked Sainath, uh, hey, this is what uh, one participant in your program said. Now, Sainath, of course, completely denied it, saying that, no, of course, this particular uh, native breed has been completely eliminated, and there's not one single cow or bull that is available of this particular breed, and that has been irretrievably lost, thanks to this public program on uh, milk yield. Now, you see, it's very difficult to argue with uh, Sainath because one, uh, he's uh, extremely polemical in his uh, thing and he's very, very uh, loquacious in his uh, presentation. So I gave up uh, trying to defend or you know, put a counter question. But uh, the bottom line is that you know, delivering public outcomes through policies and programs is our task. So therefore, um, uh, that we have to recognize that if you're trying to use the public uh, uh, you know, sector to bring about change, I think it's not going to be that easy. Uh, uh, so every one of us have to think in terms of what is it that we can contribute to ensuring that we are not uh, you know, uh, completely kept out of the picture and we can add our little might into this. Uh, if nothing else, at least we can reflect on these problems and see what is it that we on our own can come up with as a solution. After all, uh, reflection is a very, very fundamental to uh, a problem-solving approach. I mean, uh, a person by the name of Siddharth sat under a Bodhi tree for 14 years and did nothing but reflect upon issues that was very much exercising him. And that resulted in 
a whole religion which had a huge sway over this landmass and spread its influence even across uh, uh, the other parts of the world. So therefore, uh, reflection is fundamental to any eventual solution to solving a problem. So therefore, even if you are not able to contribute, please do think about the issues that the author is highlighting. And uh, I'm sure um, uh, there would be um, uh, some positive change uh, for the better. And as Mr. Cowell mentions in his book, that uh, 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 Birsa and uh, Rasika do migrate to an uh, urban habitation and live a very prosperous life. I mean, uh, he, he, his book doesn't seem to hold that much promise of that outcome. But uh, you know, let, uh, we can always uh, hope that uh, something of that kind happens. And I'm sure uh, if these policies are implemented, uh, and of course, through the collective effort of each and every one of you, maybe something good will come out of it. But I, I do have one particular aspect on which uh, I would like to place it here. But of course, uh, I would expect him to, you know, uh, I mean, I don't expect him to uh, respond to it right away. But uh, this is on this question of um, a labor force participation, um, uh, which I mean, the numbers that come out in, in, in publications, especially in newspapers and journals, is a very depressing reading. But I would like to, uh, you know, pose to the audience here as well as to the author and uh, Ms. Anuradha, who is also a person who has, you know, devoted so much of time and effort, uh, energy on this kind of issue. Uh, is this, uh, this uh, labor force uh, participation is very, very poor. Now, I'm really not able to understand why this should be so. Now, the 2001 census tells us that birth rate in India was about 25 per thousand. Now, that translates into about 25 million people. So, for the people who were born in 2003, which I estimate to be again around 25 per thousand, uh, which means again in 2023, assuming a uh, employment age of 20 years, we would have had to find jobs for 25 million people. If, if only to say that we are not worsening the problem, but we are at least ensuring that things don't deteriorate further. So 25 million, now what do the macro numbers say? Uh, the uh, Employee Provident Fund uh, organization puts out monthly sta st uh, statistics on what the numbers are. And in fact, I must thank Mr. Venu for having drawn my attention to it in the first place. Now. I found out that between 2021 and 2122, which is the latest year for which this data is available, um, uh, I think roughly about um, 21 million people have been given jobs in the formal sector. Now, mind you, this does not include employment in the government, both state government, central government, and municipal administration. So you can add some pro you know numbers to that, uh, though there are serious reservations about how many more people that the government is, uh, I mean, there is a freeze on employment in the public sector and so on, but I'm sure numbers do keep growing. I don't think uh, anybody can seriously argue that these governments have not really increased their workforce. Now, to that, if you add uh, another statistic, I was looking at the Labor Ministry's uh, eShram portal uh, dashboard, and it tells me two things. One, there are 20 one, oh sorry, 17 crore people who have registered in this portal. Now, 17 crore people is a fairly sizable number. Now, all of them may not be employed in very fashionable jobs uh, or uh, uh, lucrative jobs, but every one of them has some kind of a stake uh, which provides them some source of income, and otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't have bothered to get, register themselves in the Eastern portal. Now, 17 crore people clearly suggest to me that we are definitely adding through the informal sector a fairly significant number of people uh, into the workforce. So therefore, if two and a half crore people are getting employed every year in you know, uh, not so lucrative jobs or otherwise, um, uh, at least we are not making the problem worse than what it is now. So therefore, uh, uh, this is a, is, a, is a puzzling thing uh, with the numbers vis-a-vis -vis what the economists uh, tell me. In fact, uh, I've been in uh, conversation with a few economist friends of mine. And uh, one, I, I asked them, look, 
when you talk about labor force participation, you know, it consists of two things, uh, a numerator and a denominator. Now, the numerator is the people who actually got employment, and denominator is the number of people for seeking employment. Now, what is the data on that? Now, we, I, I, in fact, oh, one of those persons uh, wrote back to me, uh, in fact, uh, I, I uh, I would like to read that. Uh, for, it's very instructive uh, to you, for you to just understand how difficult it is to uh, 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 you know uh, get a, a a lever on the size of the problem. I'm not saying that there is no unemployment in this country. Uh, if you just excuse me for a second, I'll just uh, open my phone and then uh, read out that message. Questions about employment cannot be answered dogmatically. There are different ways of measuring employment in India, and even well-trained statisticians who are not in the payroll of any political party have different perspectives on how the data should be interpreted. These different, at times even conflicting positions, are reasonable in their own way. I repeat, these positions, even if conflicting, are reasonable in their own way. Please share the material I will send with your friend who is Evidently intelligent enough. I must, I must thank the correspondent for giving me credit uh, on intelligence, enough to make up his own mind. Now, you can understand. So what this means is that shorn of all the shibboleths and uh, you know, uh, uh, jargon, what, you're saying, what the person is saying is that uh, we just don't know what is the size of the denominator. So then what happens to your periodic labor force survey and the numbers and so on? And, People write uh, lengthy op-ed page uh, articles on this. Uh, I, I leave it to you to figure out uh, you know, what is the way forward in this. But surely, this is an important question for no other reason than that um, you know, livelihood is, I think, at the root of all the problems uh, in the sense that guaranteeing a superior source of livelihood is not going to ensure gender equality. It's not going to ensure that there is better nutrition for the children, and so on. But I think you give yourself a little extra leverage by ensuring that people at least have access to superior livelihood. So therefore, this is not a very uh, trivial issue. Therefore, uh, the, we need to first get and fix on what really is the size of the problem before we attempt any solution. And of course, given the limitations of whether the public sector being able to deliver it or not, is there a need for civil society to also contribute, etc. Those come much later. But to begin with, I think we should know what is the size of the problem when it comes to livelihood. And only then, rest of the social sector improvements are possible. Now, uh, I, I mean, I, this is a limited take as far as uh, my uh, uh, reading of the book is concerned. And I, there are other issues also, but I think uh, that can wait for another day. Uh, but uh, perhaps uh, uh, I can now, if, with the permission of uh, Mr. Cowell, um, uh, uh, to throw the questions, uh, I mean, to throw the session open for audience uh, to post their questions. But before that, I would just give Mr. Cowell to respond to the presentation made by Ms. Anuradha as well as uh, whatever intervention that I've just made, in case he wants to say something on that. Thank you. Um, uh, thank, and first, uh, let me begin by thanking Anu for uh, a very flattering uh, review of my book. And uh, I hope uh, even if, it, if when you read the book, uh, it meets 50% of what Anu says it has, I would be quite uh, pleased. So on the labor employment issues, you're right that Especially in the Indian context, one that informal employment is a large chunk of India's employment. Self-employment is a large chunk. And then across genders, labor, uh, female labor force participation. In fact, I have myself highlighted that even the methodology to say that only 23% of women are in the workforce itself could be flawed. It's no, it does not mean that women are not working. And when people are unemployed, it does not mean that he is not using a Swiggy or a Zomato to get some basic livelihood. Now, how do we measure that? Uh, to what extent the PLFS measures that? To what extent CMIE uh, data analytics measures that? It is going to be a problem as long as you have such a large chunk of the economy, which still remains not really organized, so you can get a census or use EPF data to do that. 
but but certainly the debate is very legitimate all i can say is that i think everybody does argue that we need to do more for generating more employment and our growth strategies must focus on employment because livelihoods is going to be the essence of this issue but i'd like uh, the audience now to please respond not only to this issue but other issues highlighted yeah uh, trying to balance the gender now make up for it <laughs> uh, thank you uh, so much uh, sanjay because there's so much optimism um, first of all there's optimism that there are a few people here like you who are thinking that uh, it's time for action and thinking about turning the whole thing on its head and uh, i must confess i haven't read the book yet i really look forward to reading it uh two things struck me uh when you talked about you know 400 plus welfare schemes not reaching the people uh as someone working in the social sector i think one of the biggest gaps is the absence of participatory research the absence of communities as stakeholders so it's always a top down approach uh, they are recipients they're not actually stakeholders are at the table at the planning stage i work in tb and i laugh to myself when i'm sitting in delhi in air conditioned rooms talking about what is best for the patients uh, you know with with tb with none of them at the table now a sea change has happened we are bringing them in so one of the questions that i mean something to think about uh, maybe it is there in your book is how important it is to uh, get community as stakeholders at the table uh, for a sustainable anything to be sustainable in the development sector i think we need communities on board so that is one thing second thing i'm not an economist by any means at all uh but i just wanted to ask you uh, i was fascinated by this your hypothesis of migrating to better jobs and uh, migrating to a better infra urban infrastructure um i wanted to know if you had any thoughts on how do we uh, lift up or alleviate rural poverty with people remaining in the rural areas itself so uh, these are just some thoughts and uh, i would love to engage with you on one to one on this later on thank you uh my name is uh, rajivan and i wish i could speak as well as dr nalini because i have a similar question uh, congrats sanjay it is uh, well worth uh, looking at these issues the question i have is that assuming all what you say is true we do need a radical change in development policy it has to be bottom up education health public goods public transport things which benefit all of that assuming all of that no one's arguing on that question really is that the people who are crying for this change who have all the incentive for the change people like that girl in the book or people who works as my domestic help they want clean water clean sewer but they have no power to make that change happen on the other hand people like us who hang out in these kind of places have the power to make the thing happen but have no incentives we would rather go to office and you know do something here and there so there's a mismatch between powers and the power to make change happen and the incentive to make that change happen so in the context of these specific policies which are being advocated how does change really happen now in most other societies which have done these good public work public goods thing the meiji rule in japan or uh, sri lanka or even kerala it's always been political change which has driven this not a bunch of academics or bureaucrats or the press which does these things because of this incentive mismatch so in the context of these policies what will trigger the change yeah here yeah, there's one question okay very short question i was really curious when you mentioned sanjay that uh, the role of private sector in the whole alternate uh, development strategy agenda of the country you look at last few years the csr budgets have really gone up it's running to thousands of crores do you think the private sector participation is more cutting the check and no more involvement than that or they should be working more in a focused manner to address the gaps that you are trying to seek in the book yeah. we'll take this set and then move yeah. on to the I next uh, yeah um nirmala lakshman no, no economist but i'd like to congratulate uh, sanjay on what is apparently a great book um i just have a question you spoke a lot about sampat mentioned uh, the workforce aspect and uh, you said generally the you know the same old thing around uh, and around has not worked i wondered about the impact of uh, schemes like the rural employment guarantee scheme which has been much touted in the earlier regime and even now i mean there may have been 
budgetary constraints. But what has that kind of impact had on migration? And you said migration is increasing. Doesn't seem to kind of correlate with the push that the government has given to this uh, MNREGA. And what is the impact on uh, female headed households? I just wondered if you care to comment on that. I'll start with the last question. So coming to this, um, uh, I have argued that Manrega has been certainly a very good social security. Uh, 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 but you know, it's also led to a reverse, reverse form of feminization. It's the only scheme of the government where more than 50% beneficiaries are women. And because this is the most base type of livelihood that you can get. Minimum wage or sometimes even below minimum wage. And you find that low skill agriculture labor, which is what women do, or Manrega, these are the kind of uh, occupations that women have been forced to do. Unfortunately, there is also an issue with, with women's participation that educated women drop out of the workforce. And there's a lot of evidence of that, that, that as you get educated, till you reach level of Dr. Anuradha Rajivan, you you don't you opt out of the workforce because the household uh, uh, the the gendered mindsets of the patriarchal patriarchy uh, 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 plays that so it's a very complex kind of issue and we talk of a u shaped curve in uh, women's uh, participation but uh, so th so uh, the, the uh, indian household including rural households uh, is aspirational the male worker wants a better livelihood so he's a chap who's going to migrate it's not the woman who's going to migrate, and eventually the woman will migrate. As far as agriculture potential is concerned, I've said that all the evidence points that 4%, 5% is the maximum that you can squeeze out of agriculture. And there is no country in the world where you know 60, 70% of households can get meaningful livelihoods. I've also said that traditional livelihoods, which is very so important source of livelihoods in the non farm uh, in in the, uh, the agriculture in rural areas and non farm sector that has also seen a traditional decline whether you have handicrafts where you have uh, the, you know handlooms all of them have seen steady decline and of course this decline started with handicrafts from the british colonial era but it has continued and exacerbated uh, handicrafts for instance 80% of the export market is captured by one country in china alone so that is a kind of challenge that India faces. And we have to recognize that challenge and not live in denial that something much can be done. I have given solutions to how we can modernize, for instance, the handloom industry, the, how we can modernize the hand, handicraft industry, and what technology uh, can be brought into traditional livelihoods. But you will find better sucker only in urban areas. And unfortunately, that is the position that uh, the reality that we are in. Uh, anu would you like to comment on you know partly i don't fully agree with you but uh, partly uh, it's true that uh, there is a global trend and um, and i think tamil nadu is already urban like more than 50% is already urban so rural is more and more the exception and urban is the main like the majority of the people so what really may be a good way to think about this issue is how to transform rural areas that the so-called all the urban facilities happen become the norm everywhere so you don't have this urban versus rural and let's give people jobs in rural areas so they remain there and don't come to cities but rather the infrastructure uh, capacity changes and why can't everything be like singapore why do why do we have to say that you remain rural and so when i talk of urban i am not talking of the big towns so in fact, the 2011 census itself, you should actually ideally should have had a much larger urban population. There was the requirement that if 60-70% of the uh, uh, employment is from agriculture, the irrespective of the settlement size, you will declare it as rural. So a lot of your village panchayats, they are Bihar village panchayats which have a population of 10,000. Now by any uh, international indicator, they are really urban. But since they still are treated as village panchayat, the urban services and urban infrastructure that should go hand in hand with that village panchayat is lacking. So when I'm talking of urbanization, I'm talking of this kind of small towns and settlements where people have already migrated to. 
and which actually have a large dense population of 5,000, 8,000, 10,000, which European countries would actually qualify as urban. Would you like to respond on Mr. Anand's point about CSR? Say CSR, even if it is tightly regulated, 2% of profits is neither here, okay. neither here nor there. I've been a corporate head and I believe uh, private sector should be for profit to expect them to do CSR. There will be exceptions than philanthropists like uh, Azim Premji but, uh, and Nandan Nilkani. Nilkel Good luck to them. But uh, the, the whole idea of a private sector not working for profit but for some illusory, uh, you know, aspiration to promote human livelihoods, I think is more romantic than even my book. Uh, sir, myself, Murli Krishnan from Chennai. Uh, sir, our policies are more related to demand makes us rich and we are forgetting how the supply comes to be. Demand does not make us rich and uh, know how we are going to make the make people more productive and how we enable the real conception. This is my first question. The second question is like, now we are close to 3 trillion economy, you know, uh, India. To achieve this, you know, uh, in most of the Indian states, ponds becomes high courts and then marshlands becomes, you know, IT parks and skyrocketing apartments. Uh, do you have any uh, opinion comment about the biocentric, uh, biodiversity-centric growth and developments? Do you have you wrote any article in your books regarding this? My question is, would it be right in saying that uh, the approach that you advocate is some kind of subaltern approach to economic policy, not in any derogatory sense, but in a, you know, bottom-up approach? And how would you dovetail it with the conventional growth and reform strategy? So would you say that growth is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. And you already touched upon two reforms, I think, one on the labor force and the other one on housing. Would there be any other reforms you would suggest as well? Uh, good evening, sir. That. I'd like to pose three sub-questions in and of itself, three pertaining to the topics being discussed, primarily being the uh, low-income development housing, low-income housing developments. As referred to in the past, we have seen American developments happen in a similar nature and have led to widespread spurs in crime and irregulated movement of people from urban to rural areas and the, the like of, which cannot be monitored particularly. This being the first topic. Second topic being the reach of the schemes, as in the awareness of the general target audience who the schemes are meant for, being a primary issue in today's world where people are more aware of a movie's release rather than compared to a scheme that holds them in their complete full benefit. Thirdly being the uh, development cost of transportation facilities. When facilities are developed, the cost of using them also goes up and might, all, might not reach the target audience as intended, even though their income and uh, spending ability increases. Yeah, we have Mr. Krishna here. Sorry, I, I just, I'll try and be brief. Uh, just two points. Uh, I mean, there are lots that I would love to read more about the book and find out. I'm Krishnan, uh, incidentally, Secretary of Industries, Government of Tamil Nadu. Uh, two issues which I thought uh, were of specific interest. One is this whole issue on urbanization. I mean, there could be multiple kinds of urbanization, as you already pointed out. And I think where Tamil Nadu stands out with relation to even Karnataka and Telangana is the size of the principal city compared to other cities and how urbanized the rest of the state is, one. And uh, second, that uh, even in Tamil Nadu, the rural incomes are far more non-agricultural than they are agricultural, in the sense that industry and service incomes uh, in rural areas are significantly non-agricultural. And that's also because you talked about models of industrialization like cracker, firecrackers and matchboxes and things, and I've been a district collector in those areas. A lot of people travel from villages to nearby either towns or even other villages to work in those kind of factories. And that's probably a model, particularly with this new uh, non-leather footwear and things which we can attempt where, you know, in, in rural pockets. They continue to live in rural areas, but find non-agricultural jobs and incomes go up. So probably the, mm, uh, the model of urbanization that we speak about and the model of uh, finding non, uh, non-agricultural non jobs in rural areas is probably a bigger story which we need to focus on. That was one uh, thought which I wanted to leave with you. And the second one was, you know, the interesting thing of contrast between states that you talked about and what is happening in states. Um, the point that uh, Mr. Rajivan made regarding, 
you know, where are the communities? Now, before where are the communities, I think the more important question to ask is where are the states in this entire policy making and how much of resources is available to them to actually make programs and policies mm -hmm. of the kind that they want rather than have programs which uh, she was talking about on TV which are made in air-conditioned rooms in Delhi. So uh, I think both of those in terms of approaches, how relevant would be is, is a question that I have. Can we take a last question please from there and then... Yeah. We'll uh, my name is Raju Gopalan. My question is on college education. Uh, surveys after surveys indicate that uh, more than 80% of our college graduates are not employable. And despite you know several years of uh, education, higher education reforms, uh, has your book addressed this problem, sir? Any thoughts on the potential or possible solutions? So I think a lot of questions have been asked and I don't have answers to most of them and lot of the comments are very valid. Uh, to your gentleman's question about supply uh, not taking place, unfortunately the book argues the reverse that impoverished households do not have an articulated demand and that partly answers what Anu was saying, why is there no people's up movement? And I argue that there will never be a people's up movement because Birsa and Rasika are so caught up in their daily, daily struggles that if you think that they should join up a political group and go to the streets, they have other priorities in their lives. And that is the reason why despite government policy is not benefiting them directly, there is no articulated demand neither for a political mobilization of the kind that Anu was hinting at, nor even for the kind of welfare schemes that exist. So in fact, I argue that even where there is supply, there is no demand. So, so you, there may be a vaccination camp in your village, but I say that maybe the, the how... Demand for water. Yeah. No, so th th there I have got into a little philosophical issue of, of Hinduism and the concept of what purity means and uh, why, 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 uh, why, why open defecation rates are much lower in Bang Bangladesh than compared to India. But so th there, there, are, there are multiple ways of why toilets are not getting used, even when they are built. And uh, you, you have a look at the book and I, I think the whole idea is not to, for me to articulate or advocate one solution, but to trigger a debate of what could be various alternatives. So therefore it is not the alternative, it is an alternative agenda that I have before you. Thank you for that interesting discussion. I think the discussion can go on uh, and there would be views and counter views. But uh, we do have to draw a close and I don't want to embarrass our guests by people start walking on. 7.30 is our, you know, dead stop over here. So, thank you very much, sir. That was a very fascinating presentation. And I'm sure uh, as more and more people read your book, uh, and form opinions as you've asked them to do. Uh, we'll get deeper into the subject and we hope that we'll see you more often at our forum. Thank you, Mr. Sampat, for moderating the session and giving your own valuable insights into the whole uh, development story. Uh, of course, each one of us has our own perspectives. And if you ask us to talk, we'll talk at a tangent, especially since 2011 has been my baby, the census of 2011. So you talked a lot about the urban scenario and the census towns which uh, have been highlighted in the 2011 census. And that is a story by itself. There is another story of connectivity and development where we found that most of the towns which are coming up are coming up on the national highways, state highways and very few on the district roads and the other uh, roads. So connectivity is the key. Uh, some people argue as far as development is concerned. So there are lots of uh, side themes that we can explore in this development uh, story. Thank you very much Anu ma'am for bringing different perspective. Uh, we are often accused of being very gender biased because we don't have panels which have enough of uh, uh, women and I you brought that perspective of gender also to the whole uh, debate. So thank you very much for 
gracing the CIC. We uh, thank the audience who has turned up in large numbers. And some housekeeping announcements for the next month. Uh, we have a series of very interesting programs coming up. We have a program on construction using 3D printing. Then we have a presentation on uh, the missile program of India by a lady uh, scientist and uh, that uh, that is likely to be very interesting and we are still uh, looking for possible interesting speakers to come in uh, in the next month so we request all of you to grace the CIC with your presence uh, we would like to have more and more interesting uh, topics for discussion and we encourage any of you who has ideas on whom to invite we would be happy to uh, host them at the CIC. So thank you very much for this uh, lovely evening and we hope to see you more often at our CIC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.